The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we'll revisit our story about twin sisters who combined forces to become powerhouses in the knitting world and see a twist on how one doctor helped heal an entire community. Have you ever started a project that spun off into something larger than you ever imagined? Twins Bonnie Smola and Donna Story had that happen to them doubled. Their combined energy and enthusiasm makes a great yarn that had us laughing our socks off. Some things just go together, like peanut butter and jelly or bacon and eggs. In Northeast Iowa, it's Donna Story and Bonnie Smola. We split an egg. We split an egg. <laughs> If you ask them, Donna and Bonnie will tell you they were splitting things before they were even born. Born Bonnie and Donna Ketchum, the twin sisters have always had that special connection shared only by twins. Even to the point sometimes where we wear the same clothes and we have no intention of wearing the same outfits. We look at each other sometimes when we get in the car and say, oh, you got that on today, so did I. Because they grew up sharing everything, including interests, it was no surprise that when Donna took an interest in spinning that Bonnie also took an interest in spinning. Very often, Bonnie and I take our spinning wheels and sit either on her porch or my porch and we spin outside or we can take them into the woods or anywhere and sit where it's comfortable. Because they weren't happy with the quality of the wool they were getting, they decided they could do better by raising their own sheep. The idea of a few sheep quickly grew to a flock of over 70 ewes and rams. With so many sheep, the next thing Bonnie and Donna needed was to learn how to shear them. See what a good job we did shearing. Yes, yes, we did a good job. Oh, there's one that doesn't look that good. We had a little trouble with shears. What Bonnie and Donna got by learning how to do the shearing themselves was bruised. Together, they ended up with a lot of bruises, but they also ended up with a lot of wool. I wish I could tell you how much in a bag. I have forgotten what a bag holds, but it's well over 100 pounds yeah. uh, per bag. And each sheep gives, uh, well, this year, it's to between 10 and 15 pounds of wool that we got. Uh, because the, the staple, which is how long it is, is very long. It's about six inches this year. So it's, you know, one thing leads to another all the way through. With that much wool, they found themselves with a lot of yarn. And since one thing does indeed always seem to lead to another, the next step was for them to figure out what to do with so much yarn. They bought a flatbed knitter and began taking lessons, but then Bonnie bought an odd little machine that could only knit socks. One thing just leads to another. I had the machine and I had been playing with it and then came the spin-off magazine said that they wanted to uh, have people enter a contest with their home spun wool. And I thought, okay, I'll spin my wool and I'll knit mine up on a machine. And so I knitted on the sock knitting machine and sent it in telling them I used this antique sock knitting machine and, uh, and wrote a little blurb about the history of the machine. History has always been of interest to Bonnie and Donna, and the history of this little machine that knits socks is a yarn worth sharing. 
According to Richard Candy, author of The Hand-Cranked Knitter and Sock Machine, Jonas Aiken invented the circular sock machine for use in the home in 1858. The invention started a cottage industry in America that saw an increase during the Civil War with home knitters on both sides knitting socks for soldiers. A number of companies began manufacturing the machines, with some not only selling customers machines, but also yarn with a promise to buy back finished socks. World War I saw a resurgence in machine sales when the Auto Knitter and Gearhart companies sold 25,000 machines to the Red Cross to knit socks for soldiers. Everyone from society ladies to working class volunteers knitted socks for British, Canadian, and American soldiers, but after the war, the network of home knitters began to unravel in a market that was being flooded with surplus military textiles. It all but fell apart when the post office brought charges of mail fraud against several companies for inflated claims regarding how much a home knitter could sock away in profits. When Bonnie sent her socks and the paragraph she had written on the history of the circular knitter into Spinoff magazine, it was printed along with a request for parts she needed for her antique machine. The response was overwhelming. When I got tired of answering every letter individually and a lot of the questions were the same, I thought it'd make a lot more sense to make one big answer and put everybody's question in it and send it to everybody. And I thought it might as well be a newsletter. And so I said, this is the introduction of a newsletter. Just as in knitting, where one stitch leads to another, Bonnie took up desktop publishing and started the CSMSA, or Circular Sock Machine Society of America. Four times a year since 1996, Bonnie has been sharing what she and others have learned about their odd little machines with over 200 members across the nation. It was in 1999 the CSMSA held its first convention. What's now a yearly event offers knitters the chance to take a class on everything from how to maintain their machines to how to dye wool. And there are those who find the convention an opportunity to meet face to face with a person who can tell them how to just make the darn thing work. See, there you're in business and your machine's working. Over the years, Donna and Bonnie have collected quite a few circular sock machines. They've begun to dye the yarn they spin using plants found in their own backyards and have learned that circular sock machines will make a lot more than just socks. And because we're talking Iowa, there had to be a piggy that went along with her. They also discovered that, like the machines they knit socks on, a good yarn often comes full circle. Once again, they and knitters across America are using their machines to knit socks for soldiers, this time for military men and women serving you know, in Iraq. What a, what a thing to be back making socks on these machines uh, for the guys who are protecting our country. It's just, well, sort of like history revisited. In so many ways, Bonnie and Donna make a fine pair. And while everyone does indeed have the same number of hours in a day, the two of them seem able to make the most of every minute. Oh, you get tired, yes, but you have to be enthusiastic about life. It's, it's the good kind of a tired. It isn't the bad kind of a tired. After almost 27 years at IPTV, the tapes in our library are like a mosaic of meaningful experiences for me. The labels trigger memories of rewarding adventures and revealing interviews, each story with its own set of lasting images and words to remember. This week we'll revisit a story that went a long way toward fulfilling my secret desire to turn back time. It's a story of some brave souls from the Amenas who decided to document their lifestyle before it was lost. What if, by means of forbidden photographs, you could go back in time and witness life in a turn-of-the-century religious utopia? Author Abigail Forstner provides that opportunity and goes a step further by exposing the photographers who took the pictures. They have left a tapestry 
of life here a hundred years ago. And uh, they all seemed to have an understanding um, that this was their one chance to record a way of life that was changing rapidly and that uh, they could see the changes and wanted to document what was going on here. Here refers to the group of villages known as the Amana colonies, a self-sufficient communal society founded by German immigrants in the mid-1800s. They kind of wanted to sustain this independent lifestyle where, where they would uh, share their mutual prosperity um, to allow everyone um, more time to just focus on a spiritual life and a spiritual world. Emphasis on one's spiritual life required the rejection of worldly vanities like photography. It took the charm and perseverance of an outsider to give a few brave souls a taste of the forbidden fruit. In 1890, Bertha Horak, a young photojournalist studying at the University of Iowa, began documenting life in the Amana colonies. She was very idealistic. She loved the Amanas. I think the elders uh, just decided, well, you know, what harm can it possibly do to let dear Bertha come in and take a few pictures? Well, little did they know that she would be a catalyst for all of these other photographers to begin shooting. Bertha Horak Shambaugh captured hundreds of idyllic images of Amana communal life, like this priceless photo of boys learning to knit. The pictures, along with the string of photographers Bertha inspired, captured Abigail Forstner's imagination. Abigail's book, Picturing Utopia, tells the stories of those secret shutterbugs, one of whom was her great uncle William. He took some just beautiful pictures, these perfect vignettes that could have served as ads for Brunswick tires or ads for Schwinn bicycle. This upstairs window vantage point is the same one William Forstner used to capture a photograph of his own wedding procession. The groom's upward glance was clearly the signal for a friend to snap the forbidden photo. Some of the Amana photographers were leaders within the community. They loved this place. And their love of photography was strong enough to break the rules. Even though the equipment was bulky and early photography was incredibly time consuming, the Amana photographers went to great lengths to capture the beauty of life around them. It uh, was cumbersome, uh, difficult to use, um, but it gave a quality of shot that uh, they were striving for. You would have loaded it with a glass plate negative, and then you would have just triggered the shutter. Although many of the photos have been on display in the Museum of Amana History, Abigail's goal was to complete the puzzle of who took them. And when you research their work, you do know that this photograph of a holiday scene was taken by Christian Herman. And there are others on the wall taken by Friedrich Ail. Friedrich Ail secretly took a picture from a different upstairs window of townspeople walking to communion service. When elders learned of Friedrich's camera, he was banned from church for a few weeks, but continued to take photos of his children and other characters in town. What surprised me most was, was the diversity of the photography here and just the amount of great photography in this community. The diversity of the Amana photographer's work can be seen in Peter Stuck's still lifes, like the elegant simplicity of grass on a background of crumpled paper. Stuck also wrote a detailed description on how to take a self-portrait in a mirror. A man of pharmacist F. William Miller's photos covered local disasters. Miller's most famous photo is of his children walking through a forest that he helped plant as a child. It's just an absolutely beautiful picture and the spirituality uh, that becomes a kind of uh, symbolic backdrop for so many of these photographs. Miller's 1908 photo of Amana's first tourist shuttle hinted that their circle of seclusion from the outside world would soon be a thing of the past. All the more reason to treasure these glass time capsules. 
This is very typical of the glass plate negatives, and there are hundreds of them here. Uh, these, to me, are just magic windows where you feel that you could step right through and into the past. Christian Herman, who became a doctor in the Amanas, started taking pictures at age 15 and explored every facet of photography. He took great care in the way he posed his subjects. So he would have brought them out into the light and posed them carefully, uh, but they're kind of folding into one another with these very soft, uh, lovely expressions and caring that comes through that photograph. And together, they tell a lot about how people felt about each other here. This photo, taken in the same location, shows a young Christian Herman standing, seemingly oblivious to his own camera. Was Christian a transgressor caught in the act, or an artist with a keen sense of history? Regardless, he and the other Amana photographers who disregarded the ban on photography left us with nostalgic images of a gentler way of life. It was such a gift of a project to be part of. The fact that uh, there was just such a diversity of photography in this one community to discover, it was a chapter in art history that needed to be told. In 1998, McGregor's Dr. Clifford Smith was named National Rural Health Practitioner of the Year, an award he was nominated for by the residents of his community. Quite a change from the days when he battled racial slurs and acts of prejudice. And though he's been called a town hero as well as a champion of human rights, Cliff insists that he didn't do anything special. He just cared for his patients like any good doctor would. Okay, you breathe in and out through your mouth for me. He's been called the Mahatma Gandhi of rural medicine. Still a little sensitive, though, isn't it? A little bit. He's been referred to as the best thing McGregor, Iowa, has to offer. That's doing pretty good. You can still I see think. a fracture line across there. And he's been named National Rural Health Practitioner of the Year. OK, let's take a listen to your heart, Ray. But as Dr. Clifford Smith will tell you, these aren't the only designations he's had bestowed on him during his 38 years of practicing medicine in Northeast Iowa. This lady would stick her head out the door and holler, nigger, nigger, nigger. It just scared my wife and kids to death. When Cliff moved to McGregor in 1962, the town wasn't much different from what it is today. The population still hovers near 900, and the streets have retained their Norman Rockwell feel. But when Cliff first stepped foot in this quiet Mississippi River town nearly 40 years ago, it wasn't quite as welcoming as its surroundings would suggest. Back then, most residents had never seen a black person, and to many of them, prejudice seemed as natural an act as waving to a neighbor when driving down Main Street. I went to the bank, and I asked the banker if I, he could loan me some money. I felt, I'm, I'm a doctor. I ought to just be able to walk in the bank and say, give me some money, just give me some money, right? He says, well, we can loan you money if you get 25 co-signers. Can you believe that? 25 cosigners for $2,000. Those things hurt. But I wasn't mobile. I couldn't get away. I was stuck here. And um, so I didn't have the luxury of getting angry and, and uh, uh, you know, showing any of this. So I just had to, I just had to grit and bear it. In a town like McGregor, the passage of time is often marked by fishing seasons or annual community corn feeds. But for Cliff, life's milestones always seem to revolve around his race. As a child, he was known around Waterloo as the first black baby born at the city's Allen Memorial Hospital. In high school, he learned that no one expected a black kid to go to college. In fact, the principal brushed off Cliff's inquiries into college prep courses and instead offered to get him a job washing cars. And after being elected class captain at the famed Tuskegee Air School, Cliff was forced out of the program just one night before graduation. He views it as his punishment for mentioning that a white officer had called him a nigra. Yeah. And you're better from that standpoint yes, now? Yes, I'm, I'm quite a bit better from that, right. yes. 
Decades later, Cliff is commonly referred to as the cornerstone of McGregor, a town whose population is still over 99% white. I'm just looking at your uh, echocardiogram report, Ray. Uh, the 74-year-old doctor cares for nearly everyone in a 15-mile radius, and there are even plans to name a street after him. Quite a turn of events for a man who originally found the town so abrasive, he seriously considered driving his car into the river and drowning himself. The reason that I was allowed to come here, so to speak, was because the other doctor gave his okay. And I found out subsequently I got the okay because I was black. And it was felt that I'd be no competition. And he wanted somebody else in the town to take his low paying patients, his poor paying patients from him. And that's what I got. Mm -hmm. The first and, year uh, in practice, I grossed $2,000 and collected half. Are you coughing more now than you were before? Back in those days, Cliff was known to barter for his services, accepting everything from soda pop to a riding lawnmower, one that he quickly found out didn't even work. We'll take a listen to your lungs. And regardless of their ability to pay, his patients say he always treated them with the kind of warmth others generally reserve for their family members, spending so much time with each one that his waiting room would often still be packed at 8 at night. If you need any help, if things get tough and you have trouble handling it, just okay. let me know. Appreciate that. Okay. Perhaps these are the kinds of things that have today's McGregor residents talking about their doctor like he's some kind of folk hero. Say, oh. And perhaps these are the kinds of things that in 1998 encouraged community members to send handfuls of heartfelt letters to the National Rural Health Association, prompting the organization to name Cliff Rural Health Practitioner of the Year. Despite the local praise and national recognition, Cliff insists that he hasn't done anything special. He'll tell you he's just a simple man who always stops in to have breakfast with his mother, one who's been known to sneak three spoonfuls of sugar into his morning coffee. He'll also tell you that he constantly wishes he were smarter, and that just hours before he learned of his national award, he had been overwhelmed by what he calls his averageness. And I was so down, and I'm in my truck, and I started screaming to the Lord, and I said, I've never won anything in my life. Nothing. I've never won anything. I'm having a hard time now. And nothing. I never won anything at a, at a carnival. Never won a dolly at a carnival. Never, never won anything in my entire life. I was screaming and crying. And that was the morning they told me that I had gotten this award. Hi, Shirley. It may be natural to want to view Cliff's story as one man's triumph over racism, but Cliff is quick to point out that prejudice didn't motivate him, it only held him back. And despite his love for his patients, he'll tell you that what he truly wanted to be was an architect. This was an architect in Waterloo, so Dad took me to his office, and he said, I understand you want to become an architect. I said, yes, I want to become an architect. He said, I wouldn't advise that. I said, why is that? He says, there's no place for blacks in architecture. So Dad just looked at me, see, son, I told you. While Cliff says his isn't the quintessential storybook tale that many want to make it out to be, do, he does admit that it just might have the makings of a happy ending. I think I've really made an achievement when I think about it. I came here, was wanted by a lot of people, and not wanted by a lot of people. And now I think that I'm accepted, even by those people who didn't really originally want me to be here. And I love them, and I think they feel the same about me. Once again. The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.